Hello everyone and good evening. Um, my name is Ruby Byrne and I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker tonight. Um, like tonight's speakers, I'm a student at University of Washington and also a student with the Engage program. Um, I study astrophysics and cosmology, specifically using radio telescopes to search for signatures from the first stars and galaxies that turned on after the Big Bang. Our program tonight has been made possible by a special uh, collaboration between Town Hall and University of Washington's Engage program. Together they host a series called UW Science Now as part of the Seattle Science Lectures. Our speakers program will run about 25 minutes each and that includes five minutes for questions. We ask that you come to the mics at either side of the stage, there's one over there, one here, um, and form lines behind them so that uh, your questions can be picked up for the audio recording. Before I introduce our first guest, I'd like to announce a couple of other events from our science series. First of all, right after the lectures tonight at 7.30, um, there's a talk by Brian Christian and Tom Griffiths. They will discuss uh, the science of decision making. Also, the ne next talks in the UW Science Now speaker series will be right here on June 5th starting at 5.30 p.m. That's when I will discuss my research. Uh, explaining how telescopes reveal the secrets of the early universe. Joining me with, will be Meredith Staub talking about the chemistry of space and Shannon Catchell talking about snow leopard conservation. And now for our first guest. Hannah Frizzell is a PhD student in the bioengineering department at the University of Washington. She's going to tell us about vaccines and work developing oral vaccines. Please give a warm welcome to Hannah Frizzell. Thanks, Ruby, for that introduction. Oh, it's the mic quick. Can y'all hear me? <laughs> okay, so thanks for being here tonight, everyone. I'm really excited to talk to you all about my research on developing vaccines that are less of a pain. So I wanna start out by telling two stories about the history of vaccines. So we've all experienced getting vaccines, we've all benefited from vaccines, but probably not everyone knows about how they were discovered and developed. And when we're talking about the pre-vaccine era, it's really important to think about the burden of infectious disease over time and really put it into perspective. So just 100 to 200 years ago, infectious diseases were a major cause of death, unlike today. And here I've highlighted some particularly devastating infectious diseases. And I wanna focus on one in particular, smallpox, because this is really central to the story of vaccine development. So smallpox was a disease that was, would uh, present as a rash and blisters all over the body. And more serious side effects included blindness and even death. So of 20 people who were infected with smallpox, about seven would die, four would become blind, and the rest could be severely disfigured because of their blisters. And in the 19th century alone, smallpox killed about 500 million people. So this was a really terrifying disease that people were eager to find ways how to protect themselves and the people that they loved. So this brings us to our first story of Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who was an English aristocrat in 1718. And she was also the wife to the British ambassador to Turkey, and she would go on trips with him to Turkey where she saw that the native people had this technique called inoculation in order to protect themselves from getting smallpox. So what they would do is they would take the pus from the blisters of someone who's infected with a mild form of the disease, and then they would introduce this into the scratched skin of a healthy person. And so Lady Mary had a really personal history with smallpox. Her brother was infected and died from this disease, and she was also infected and survived, but had really significant scarring all over her body. So she really wanted to protect her children from this disease. So when she returned back home from Turkey, she performed this procedure on her son Edward and was luckily able to protect him from getting smallpox for the rest of his life. So then Lady Mary became a really big advocate for the use of inoculation and then this was uh, used in England and America afterwards. But there was about 2% death rate from this procedure because you were actually introducing smallpox into healthy people. So there was a lot of motivation to find new and safer ways for people to protect themselves from this disease. 
This brings us about 100 years later to Edward Jenner. And Edward Jenner was an English physician and scientist who made a really important observation that a certain portion of the population wasn't getting infected from smallpox. And these were milkmaids. So cows can get infected with a similar disease called smallpox. And so when the milkmaids would milk the cows, they would get infected with smallpox, but the disease was really isolated to only blisters on their hands and wouldn't progress to the rest of their body or be as severe of a disease as smallpox. So Edward Jenner hypothesized that the reason that these milkmaids weren't getting smallpox is because they had a previous exposure to cowpox. And while Edward Jenner was incredibly influential and smart, he may not have been the most eth ethical person. He tested this hypothesis on the eight-year-old son of his gardener. So <laughs> what he did was took the pus from the blisters of um, a milkmaid who was infected with cowpox. And this is what he then introduced into the scratched skin of the gardener's son. He then tested if the boy could be infected with smallpox. And luckily, he was not infected. <laughs> and he effectively produced the first vaccine. So the word vaccine actually comes from the story. Uh, vaca is Latin for the word cow. And then this policy of vaccination was adopted uh, in America and England after this. And because there was still a lack of understanding about the science of vaccination, there was some public skepticism about this practice. So here's a cartoon uh, from 1802 depicting some public skepticism that getting vaccinated with, small, with cowpox would actually cause patients to sprout these cow-like appendages, which of course never happened. <laughs> but because of these scientific discoveries, as well as many others who came before and after them, vaccines have had an incredible impact on human health. So here I've just shown two infectious diseases, polio and measles, with the number of cases on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And you can see after vaccines are developed and licensed, there's a dramatic decrease in the number of people who are infected with these diseases. Also through a huge global vaccination effort, we were able to completely eradicate the infectious disease smallpox, which is really incredible. So none of, none of us have to worry about getting infected with that terrible disease. And every year, about two to three million deaths are averted worldwide, thanks to vaccinations, really highlighting uh, their significant uh, achievement in uh, public health. So now that we know a little bit about the history of vaccines, I want to talk more about how they actually work inside of our bodies to provide immunity. So what immunity is trying to protect us against are these foreign invaders, which are germs. And you guys are probably familiar with a few of classes of these types of germs, particularly viruses and bacteria. And the this is the job of our immune system to protect us from infection with these germs. So I'm gonna get into a little immunology and our immune system is incredibly complicated and complex. And I'm gonna really boil it down to three main cell types that are involved in this process. So the first is an antigen presenting cell. And you can think of this cell like the detective of your immune system. So this cell is responsible for patrolling around your body and it's always on the lookout for any sign of a germ. So whenever it finds something that your body has been infected, it becomes activated and it goes to communicate with two other main types of immune cells. And these are your B cells and your T cells. Your B cells you can think of as newscasters of immune systems. And these are the cells that produce the antibodies. And you guys may be familiar with antibodies are a really big component in immunity. So what antibodies can do is they can cover the germs and they have a few functions, but two that are really important in uh, vaccine immunology are, one, this lets other cells around be able to know that this is something that they need to remove from the body. So it serves as a tag, and you can think of this kind of like putting up wanted posters all over the body so other cells can recognize it. The second thing it does when it covers germs, it can actually neutralize it and cause the germ to lose its function. So the other main cell type that these detective cells communicate with are your T cells. And these are like the police force of your immune system. 
And these cells get deployed into your body and are actually the cells that fight off and eliminate the germ. And then after the, the germ is cleared from your body, these two cell types will form into memory cells. And so the next time that you're exposed to the germ, you have a much faster and much more robust immune response. So your body does this for all the different types of germs that you're exposed to. And you have T and B cells that are very specific to each and every germ. So you have a repertoire in your body that's able to protect you. And vaccination takes advantage of the way that our bodies naturally produce immunity, but it does this in the absence of an actual infection. So the vaccines give these detective cells the information that they need to then communicate to your B and your T cells, which then produce a response to clear the pathogen from your body. And you can think of this whole process as kind of like sending your immune cells to a training academy where they see what the germ looks like and they learn how to effectively and properly fight and eliminate the germ. And what this is, is actually your lymph nodes. So you may notice that whenever you get sick, your lymph nodes might get swollen. And this is because there's tons of communication between cells and activation so that these cells are learning how to properly fight off the germs that you may be infected with. So now I want to talk a little bit more about my research in vaccine development and new directions that this field is going. So whenever you think of vaccines, probably one of the first things that you think of are needles. And I don't know about you guys, but whenever I get vaccines, I look a little something like this. <laughs> so I have needle phobia and vaccines make me really nervous and anxious and probably a lot of people in the audience here can relate, especially if you have kids that you have to get vaccines for. Uh, being on the other side of that experience, I know it is not fun. <laughs> and more than just being painful, there are a lot of global implications of having vaccines that have to be injected with a needle. So as I mentioned, people have a fear of needles. Additionally, injected vaccines can take a relatively long time to administer, and this is really critical in times of disease outbreaks or pandemics, when you need to vaccinate a lot of people in a really short amount of time. Injected vaccines also require trained medical personnel to administer the vaccines, and they also require, require sterile needles. And this, these two things aren't always available in lower resource settings. And finally, because of these resource requirements, injected vaccines can be relatively costly. And the World Health Organization has actually estimated that about a third of immunizations that have to be injected are unsafe because needles are reused that could potentially be contaminated. And this is completely doing the opposite of what you wanna do with vaccines because it could potentially further spread diseases. So, one way to overcome a lot of these challenges and in the development of new vaccines that don't use needles is to deliver vaccines orally. And this is what I'm really interested in, what my research is focused on at the University of Washington. So I want you guys to imagine an alternative reality. It's time for your flu vaccine, your tetanus booster, and you go to a clinic and instead of being greeted with a big scary needle, you're greeted with just a pill and a paper cup and you take the pill, you're on your way, you're vaccinated. How nice would that be, right? <laughs> so that sounds wonderful, but there is one really big problem, and this is you. So your body has all of these mechanisms in place that make it really, really hard for oral vaccines to succeed. So I'm gonna talk about the three main ways that your body makes it difficult for us to develop oral vaccines as well as some biomedical interventions that we're developing to overcome these. So the first big challenge is that vaccines can get broken down. So whenever you swallow something, the first thing that it'll encounter is your stomach. And this is full of acid and lots of chemicals that function to break down your food. But this means that vaccines themselves can also get broken down. And as I mentioned previously, in our training academy analogy, these vaccines need to get to the training academy so that they can educate our immune cells and that can form memory and immunity. 
But the problem is that these training academies are located further along in the small intestine. So in order to protect these vaccines, researchers are developing delivery vehicles that can protect the vaccine as it passes through the stomach. So a few examples of these technologies are particles as well as plant-based vaccines. And so these are made of things that don't break down and stand up if it's in an acidic or uh, chemical that, breaks it, that can break it down in the stomach. The second challenge is that vaccines may not get absorbed from the intestinal tract into the tissue. So your small intestine really only absorbs certain things, and most of these things are byproducts of your food that have been broken down in the stomach. So things like simple sugars or simple proteins. So this makes it really hard for vaccines to get into the tissue. So you can imagine you have your vaccine and it's moving along the intestinal tract, but it's like there's a roadblock preventing it from getting into the tissue and accessing the training academy. And instead, it continues down the intestinal tract and is removed from your body. So to address this problem, uh, researchers have identified a cell type in your intestine that are called M cells. And these cells have a special function that they can transport more things than your general uh, cells in your intestinal tract. And so these are able to transport uh, the vaccine directly to your immune cells. So researchers can target vaccines to the M cells so that they're able to effectively get to the training academies and to your immune cells. And the last big challenge is that vaccines may not be able to properly activate your immune system. So whenever those detective cells communicate to your T and your B cells, there's another decision that gets made. And this is, did what, is what the detective cell saw, is it harmful to us or is it not harmful to us? If it is harmful, then these cells get activated and trained and they learn how to fight it. If it's not harmful, these cells become tolerant. And the cells in your gut, there's a much higher bar to switch from tolerance to action. And this makes sense because most of the things that the immune cells in your gut are exposed to are derived from your food. And you don't wanna have a lot of immune responses to your food. And so what happens when, does, when vaccines are delivered orally is maybe they do get to the training academy, but the cells instead will put down their tools and their weapons and they won't properly be activated in order to generate immunity. So researchers have identified things called adjuvants, which can help or aid vaccines. And if you deliver these adjuvants alongside vaccines, then you can ensure that the cells will be activated so that you get a really robust, strong immune response. And so in my research, I use a lot of these strategies uh, to develop next generation oral vaccines so that we can have vaccines that are easier to administer, that we can access all areas of the world, are lower cost, and so that we can also make vaccines less of a pain for you and me. So with that, I'd like to thank Town Hall for giving me the opportunity to present on my research, as well as the Engage program that I'm in. I'd like to acknowledge my lab at UW. Uh, I'm in the Woodrow Lab, as well as all my funding sources. So I'll take any questions you have. Uh, so you mentioned that the uh, guy who originally created vaccines tested his vaccines unethically. What are the modern ethical testing <laughs> procedures for vaccination? <laughs> Well, you have to get um, permission from all your human subjects. <laughs> um, so people have to be aware and willing to <laughs> any vaccination testing. So there, it's a very rigorous process to get vaccines approved. Goes through a lot of um, initial evaluation, uh, preclinical trials, and then whenever it moves to clinical trials, there are a few stages in that process um, before that, making sure that everything is done ethically. <laughs> Hi, very nice talk. Uh, you mentioned plant-based vaccines. I was wondering if there are any of those that exist or if there are any existing uh, oral vaccines to date or which ones do you think are most promising so far? Yeah. 
Um, so there are no plant-based vaccines on the market, but there are a lot in development. So there's one that is um, in rice and another that's made in lettuce. And these are being evaluated still in preclinical. I don't think they've moved to any clinical trials yet. Uh, we do have oral vaccines. Um, you guys are probably familiar with here in the US, we give rotavirus orally. Um, but one thing that I didn't get into too much in my talk is that um, these vaccines are, there's different types of ways that you can vaccinate people. And a lot of the oral vaccines, or actually exclusively all of the oral vaccines that we use now are made from live attenuated germs. And so for a lot of other germs, one, you aren't able to properly attenuate them um, in the lab, or for other more infectious germs, you don't wanna take the risk of delivering something that's live. And so there's a lot of push for the next generation vaccines to be killed germs or subunit, which just means part of the germ. And these are face these challenges that I laid out um, to a lot higher degree. Okay. Hi. So I had a question about vaccinations for flu. Yeah. So I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but this year <laughs> I got my flu vaccine as I do every year, and I still got the flu. And it was really a rough one. And I heard all these rumors that, oh, well, the vaccine this year didn't hit the flu. You know, the strain that was here was different and so forth. Can you speak to that in any way about um, how we go through the process of determining what vaccines to use each year and then how effective they turn out to be? Yeah, so actually um, the speaker after me is speaking specifically on the influenza virus. So <laughs> she might be able to speak to your question a little bit better than I can about influenza specifically. Um, but I know there's a process in identifying the strains that are circulating worldwide and kind of making educated guesses about what the most infectious strains will be for the US. Um, and then those are the types of vaccines that are formulated in the influenza vaccine that we give. And different vaccines have different effectiveness uh, depending on a lot of the properties of the germ itself. So how much the germ will mutate or change itself so that then the antibodies and the immunity that you produce then can't recognize it anymore. So if your germ has a really high mutation rate in your body or even around the world as it's passing from person to person, then this makes the efficacy of vaccines decrease over time. Yeah. So corollary to the question is, so are the bugs smart? Yes. <laughs> There's a constant arms race happening between the germs that infect our bodies and our immune system. So the germ mutates, then our immune system changes what parts of the germ that it'll recognize, and then this continues on until one wins. <laughs>